Hey there, everyone, and welcome back to Porsche Club Insider, Episode 6. We're here at Podcast Studio at 5 North Main. Again, want to thank the Coffee Bar at Bel Air for the wonderful gingerbread latte that I'm enjoying today. Today, we have our normal cast and crew. I'm Vu Gwen, PCA's Executive Director. I'm your host. I'm here with Manny Albin, PCA's Technical Director. I'm here with Damon Lowney, PCA's Digital Media Coordinator, and Mr. Sass, is kind of with us on the line. <laughs> you want to explain, man? Uh, he's uh, probably when the listeners listening to this, it'll be in stereo in both ears. But for us in the studio, he's only in our left ear. So, um, so we thought there might be an option for podcast. Well, for us, we just removed the left side headset and for a Rob free experience. Rob, exactly. <laughs> for if it doesn't get edited correctly, then the listeners simply turn their balance to the right and. There you go. It's like blocking someone on Facebook. That's what you get for not being. Or they could just turn their balance to the opposite side and block <laughs> Lou and Manny and Damon. It's choose your own adventure. How's that? Right. Pick your poison. Well, welcome everyone. And uh, man, we've uh, launched the podcast. It's been a week and it's to me been quite successful in the sense where we don't really have any markers, but. I, I've compared it to our YouTube video releases, and our numbers are, you know, on par with a with a YouTube video. So I'm excited about that. Hopefully, you all are excited with the launch. And please tell friends and you know give us some feedback on what you think. Yeah, because we want to be taken off double secret probation, <laughs> yeah. which is for three months. So I feel like the uh, we have to show our value. That's an Animal House uh, reference. We uh, three months to prove. That this is a, a value to our members. Yep, exactly, exactly. Wow, even Netflix gives a series longer than that. Well, we're up for the challenge, and it is fun, and uh, hopefully you find it interesting. And again, please give us some feedback if you'd like to hear about certain topics or anything that we could improve upon. But uh, so how's you, how was everyone's holiday? <laughs> Don't all jump in at once. It was, it was I'm, good. I'm trying to I think about alone. what I can talk about and what I can't. <laughs> <laughs> How did you enjoy your holiday and t- share us your PG moments? <laughs> um, you know, it's typical family stuff. It was, uh, it was fine. Nothing, uh, nothing uh, bad a, to report. You're such a terrible liar. <laughs> <laughs> he was so happy to be back. Although I got to say, you know, you, you wonder about these, uh, these people that are at the Seven uh, Eleven. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, getting food on Christmas. Like what, what led them to the point where they're getting the... Uh, yeah, hot dogs uh, off the uh, the little roller thing that's been there for like twelve hours, and I turned out to be that person on Christmas night. <laughs> uh, it wasn't Seven uh, Eleven, but uh, we have a uh, what we call Wawa on the East Coast, which is sim- similar to Seven Eleven. I think a little more upscale, yeah, than a Seven Eleven. And um, so for Christmas dinner, we went to my oldest son's uh, home for dinner, and I am not a big ham person. And I was led to believe that we were going to have ham and turkey. Which Manny's culinary disappointment <laughs> over the holidays. And then about five minutes before we get get there, my wife tells me, "No, we're just having ham. That's all they're going to have." So Wait, in my head, you want you like ham or you don't like ham? I tolerate it. <laughs> okay. And my wife has this ham that's uh, it looks like a ham, no fat. It's just you know. <laughs> You put it on the slicer, the, the deli slicer, and it's it's livable. Okay. And uh, this ham that uh, someone had brought uh, was a very fatty. Oh, God. Yes. It had, like, bone. Yeah. I, I didn't care about having a bone in there. I just didn't want any fat in my ham. I, uh, did, I, I grabbed my plate, and I looked her at the ham, and I said, yes, I won't be eating tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I put it away. I, I even told my wife, I said, no one noticed I didn't eat. She goes, I bet you they did. I'm like, no, I don't think they did. I that think day. the bone in one with a little bit of fat is actually the more expensive one. Why? Because it's more texture, more anyway, flavor. So, well, as, as <laughs> and this is why you tuned into in Porsche Club Insider. It's yes. here. Our, our opinions on So here. on the way home, uh, our son who lives with us, he was like, do you mind if we stop at Wawa? I want to get a sub. <laughs> And I'm like, After yes. <laughs> I said, I'll go and All right. a Wawa Christmas. That was right. <laughs> that was essentially my 
Christmas dinner. Well, I was happy right. that we could just be with family. Um, you know, it's it's been tough for the past you know couple of years, and it was nice to be together. We weren't together with everyone because we had a few uh, few members that were sick. Uh, we did have this weird. Let's say, uh, how do I say this? We did get a call from indiv- an individual that wasn't happy with uh, certain things in, in Porsche Panorama. And I felt kind of sad for the person because they called and complained nine times, left voicemails about this issue. And I just had to think to myself, like, that was probably the highlight of their day to complain to us on Christmas Eve. But anyways, hope things get better for them. How about you, Damon? I didn't do much. I, I stayed at home just kind of watching TV, you know, net, Netflix and chill sort of thing. Hey, 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 we know what that means. <laughs> yeah. You could have just stopped at Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> well, my girlfriend arrived uh, uh, I on, said we could on Christmas. Stop. So. I said you could stop at Netflix. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Rob, you were on the road. <laughs> yeah, family, snow, kids, dog. You know, the yeah. usual. Uh, <laughs> now, did you where you went to Ohio? Uh, no, no, to uh, uh, to uh, Western New York. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. but then, no, I was just I, I was so riveted by by Manny's, uh, um, you know. Uh, recalling uh the you know the, the ham story the that ham. uh <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> for the so how many club of you, america how many of you switched to winter tires only to find out that we had 60 degree weather on christmas of course that's that's i appreciate you guys doing that because i didn't do the switch because i thought we still had a little bit more warm weather so i'm still on uh still on my summer tires that's why you should try some all weather tires Drive them year round, and you still have the uh, the snow tread. <laughs> all weather tires. Yep. What are all weather tires? I think Michelin makes them, but I have an Anokian uh, WRG four, so it's a a year round all season compound, but with the uh, the siping for for snow traction. Those tires do look like snow tires, and you, I do see you drive them. They look the like snow tires, but I drive them year round on my Golf and on my Camry. Are they noisy? No, no, very quiet, very comfortable. Hmm. You know, not a sporting tire, but you know they'll get you through some snow. Is, this is the guy with the almost straight exhaust of this Toyota. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You ask him if the tires <laughs> are <laughs> <going> <laughs> to, uh, tires. <laughs> so speaking of with the Z6 Camry that now sounds like a Lotus Savora. So speaking Thank of you. tires, you know, one of the conversations at our local um, cars and coffee on Sunday, one of our buddies. Girlfriend got a got a SUV and he, he bought tires and I don't know why he went like on the cheap side but he literally bought tires from Amazon and he said we went to a reputable place to get them mounted and and balanced and everything and he and he he, he drove it and it drove terrible so he, the question he had to us at the round the table at Cars and Coffee was so do you guys think it like I'm, I, I saw the guy balance them, it, it, and, you know, it, it's perfectly balanced, zero, 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 whatever, across the board. But when I drive it, the car drives terrible. Like, do you think tires, does it make a difference? I'm like, dude, you're a car car guy. How, do, how are you asking us this question? Like, don't you know tires make a difference? And I won't name the brand, but it is a really cheap, cheap brand. Like, you find this brand on eBay and whatever, and all of us at the table are like, hello of course not just because the tire is black and the tires quote unquote round they're not all created equal and i think manny can probably share with some of the experiences we had at the michelin tire center that we went and and they they showed us the difference between a good tire and a not so good tire yeah actually if you want to take a deep dive into scary tire brands that you've never heard of go to walmart.com because I don't think they carry like the name brands that we're used to. Yeah. And just for you know, just for fun, I decided to say, how cheap can I get tires for my Suburban since I don't drive it that much? And I, I ran across at least fifteen brands oh, that yeah. I have never heard of, and they were very inexpensive. But I and somebody's got to be making these tires because uh, what uh, what Boo's alluding to is when Michelin uh, invited us down to uh, visit their uh, proving ground. They let us try out these. Uh, off brand names, which turns out they actually make mm-hmm. these off brands. So it there's wasn't a like a, yeah, there's a market for it exactly. And uh, it's in the wet, 
huge difference. Oh, yeah. Uh, that sold me immediately that uh, in the dry, you might not be able to tell, but in the uh, wet, without a doubt, when you turn a steering wheel and the car is still going straight. Yeah. In fact, what we were doing, we were chasing a 3 Series BMW with these no-name or their house brand cheapy tires versus a bone stock uh, Toyota Sienna with Michelin. You know, I think factory. they were half-worn Michelins. Yeah, so. ha- yeah, just factory half-worn Michelins. And the 3 Series, no matter how hard you drove it, you could not catch this minivan. <laughs> it was the Riken Raptors. <laughs> okay, I said... But it's, a Michelin, it's a Michelin brand. Okay. <laughs> There are so so for if any you of don't you plan gone, on turning your car, any of you it's have a gone perfect tire to SEMA. There is like a, maybe a third or a half of the hall where there are these tire brands that you've never heard of, but they're they've got huge boosts because I think there is a market for a thirty five dollar tire. But honestly, I would put it on a car where my family's going to be in it. It's the you're looking for love at two in the morning at the bar. And they're closing up. That's those tires. <laughs> they're stance tires, right? Exactly. Yeah, well, yeah that, yes. you, that you know you're going to wear out anyway. So exactly. Well put cheapy ones on there. All right. So, well, um, we still have the new year ahead of us, and this is going to be our last episode of the year. But we, we've done a couple of things since our last episode. We drove a eighty thousand dollar simulator. That was uh, that was pretty wild. I. I was the most impressed, I think, uh, because I have, I think we've all driven probably motion, um, motion simulators where the, it shakes you around almost like an amusement park ride, but it resembles really nothing of the, uh, of driving a car. In fact, when I was getting uh, ready to drive this uh, motion simulator, I uh, mentioned it. I said, you know, most of these, if my real car had been doing this on a racetrack, I would have pitted immediately thinking that I lost a wheel or have my suspension collapsed. So I was pleasantly surprised that uh, this was um, actually felt like a real car. It, I mean, it was, you know, we, we've done a video, if you haven't caught it, um, how to get started in PCA sim racing. And you can kind of start with a lower budget, just steering wheel and, and, and using your, your basic computer. And this is the complete opposite end. And the folks at Spark Virtual Racing came down from Connecticut with a trailer and they brought two units a static seat simulator as well as this eighty thousand dollar as tested simulator with three screens and you know the what did they call that that motion platform i can't remember what because it was like a red box what was interesting to me is the um the footprint of this full simulation was much smaller than the ones like i've seen at the pec uh in la and pec in atlanta and i've driven those and I, I, I'm a delicate flower. I can't ride teacup rides at, at the amusement park. I can't do the typical simulators like at PEC. Like, I make myself sick. But I was surprised to drive. Maybe I'm just a high-end simulator driver because I drove the $80,000 one, and I was fine. Well, you get what you pay for. <laughs> what do you think? So, so Damon, Damon and Jim Hemig, our, our marketing director, they... They drive quite a bit, the simulators that we have at the office, and Jim even drives competitively in the PCA Sim Racing Series. What did you think of it, Damon? I really liked it. Uh, it was nice to be able to feel what the car is doing when you're especially under the brakes and, and trailing the brakes onto a turn. Uh, so trail braking was easier to recognize and, and react to or act to in uh, uh, the full motion rig compared to the, the static simulator that we had. Uh, it was just a lot of fun. Um, I didn't go as... Fast as Jim, I think Jim is is the new sim racing champ here, and he got his uh, fastest lap time at Road America. It was a two oh nine something in the uh, full motion rig after you know fifteen minutes of learning the system and and doing. He a adapted few laps. to it quickly. Yeah, I mean, he did to be to put his put down his fastest lap. Like he drives a lot. I think he drives yeah. almost every day at home. Yep. And then he hopped into this thing, and fifteen minutes later, he had his quickest time. Yep. He I did. mean. You know, at, at that price point to be two seconds faster. I mean, you paid how much to be a little bit faster than me? Oh, uh, in yeah. your car, uh, yeah, let's say <laughs> five thousand bucks or something. <laughs> Six. So, so your return on investment is a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll we'll see about that. You oh. know, I think I've got to keep the car for a few years to get that return. Uh huh. 
No, but, uh, you know, obviously this $80,000 simulator isn't for everyone, but it sure was cool to experience what, like, the best of the best is. And, and the way, I know there's uh, simulators that, you know, for those that are in the business that have, you know, full motion and it's sort of professional grade and they make everything. This company, they just go out and source the parts that they think are the best or they think you know, will work well with what the, you know, the buyer is going to need for their, their system. And then they put it all together. That, that's the thing is I bought parts and Jim helped me and, and Aaron Ambrosino helped me to get myself started. Doug, the, our sim racing chair helped me get started, but there was a steep learning curve to, to put it all together and get it running. Whereas these, these folks, if you have the means, they'll build you one, they'll show up with a trailer, put it in, you know, whatever spot you want, hook it all up in one button, turn it on and start driving. And something that's great about what Spark does, it's the company is called Spark Virtual Racing is uh, in addition to putting all the, the, the pieces together, they're also tuning the software for the direct drive steering wheel and, you know, in the full motion rig, the the shaking and, and the, the movement that it does. So you're also getting that expertise that if you're not a software programmer, you know, you wouldn't be able to do. Yeah. And they, and if let's say Manny wanted his 964 in the game, they have the ability to create digitally your 964 so that you can drive it on track. Yeah. That's a game called Assetto Corsa or Simulator. So oh. there's the iRacing crowd, then there's Assetto Corsa. And Assetto Corsa is um, less about the racing uh, than it is about driving on track. There is racing, but you can pick your own car, have it developed, as Vu said. Uh, it's what the IMSA, big IMSA race teams actually do. Is they have their exact car developed for the game so that they can get some testing done uh, before they hit the racetrack. Hmm. Yeah. So speaking of racing... Who saw the news on uh, latest Le Mans car from Porsche? Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Um, you know, it's uh, it's always more fun to watch racing when Porsche will go for the overall win, and uh, hopefully, we see this a uh, lot in the United States. That's uh, maybe even next year at Daytona. Actually, I'm, I hope we see some prototype of it maybe at uh roar before the 24 you think that soon <laughs> they're talking about january isn't it uh they're gonna have uh i'm not sure about the prototype but they've got about a year left before the car is gonna be racing so, so that tells me they yeah. got to get the prototype out at least a and year get, before yeah, to start, start testing, testing it. yeah yep. so hopefully we start to see some spy shots um so if i'm i'm not deep into the details of it but the platform that they're using it's not they want to win overall, but aren't there cars above the class that they're in? They're they're in what LM LMDH. Okay, so LMDH means they have like three or four platforms to start with. Chassis, yeah. chassis, yeah. Okay. Multimatic in Canada, I believe, makes um, the Porsche LMDH chassis. Okay, oh, here it is: Delara, Multimatic, yep. Legier, or Rica. So LMDH is kind of like a spec formula, maybe not totally spec because the manufacturers can do the body work themselves and, and customize the car in certain ways. But you, you're picking from one of those four, I believe, chassis manufacturers. You can put your own engine in there, and I believe it's a Williams battery powering yeah. a motor um, and the rear wheels for LMDH. Mm. So a little yeah, hyper I mean, car. What's that? No, it's it's a spec car, but it's not, it isn't like, if anybody remembers like LMP2 from like five years ago where every car was like an identical Oracle. I, I don't think it's going to be yeah, like they're that. Yeah, they are not identical. No, oh, okay. no. Right. Hmm. So, so with that sort of platform, I mean, is it plausible to think that they would win overall if they're going against like hypercars? And what's the difference with a hypercar? Hypercar, you have to make, uh, I think, I believe it's 25 road cars in the first year of competition. Um, there are no restrictions there, and there's no spec chassis. It's all up to the manufacturers to Ooh. design the whole chassis, the powertrain, and everything. So potentially they're faster, but we don't know. Um, it's up in the air. Like a Glickenhaus would be a... A Glickenhaus uh, yeah. would be the hypercar. You know, I think Ferrari <clears throat> has one, Peugeot. So That'll be great, I think, to see Porsche and Ferrari back on the track. Some mm -hmm. of the, these brands that uh, you know immediately translate into... Seats in the uh, box office or the uh, grandstands, rather. So well, you're not excited about seeing Peugeot? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, Peugeot yeah, looks awesome. the field. competitive, right? Is Toyota back into it, too? 
uh, Toyota was what uh, when they got out, uh, they were like the only car racing uh, yeah. overall at Ma seemed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no right. I mean, one, yeah. let's. I mean, this is really all about. I mean, LMP one. The cost of that had gotten pretty much unsustainable, and Toyota was like the, the last one standing. So, I mean, this is really kind of a uh, a cost saving measure that's that's making it possible to have a more diverse fielding in at the top, right? I mean, isn't that really kind of what this is all about? Well, I think also it's worth mentioning that uh, at the same time when this is coming out, uh, we're going to have F1, and you know the rumors of Porsche. Uh, getting back into F1 and some other brands from the uh, Volkswagen Auto Group. Man, they're going to have to involved. dig into that piggy bank if running in two of these. Yeah, well, I remember when they were building a third building at Wysock, and they said it was for the 919. Obviously, they had a bigger uh, plan than just the 919 because this will be a lot of race engineers in Wysock for these two programs. That's pretty exciting to see our brand back back into these platforms. Um, Formula One is kind of, to me, it scares me because yeah. uh, at, at endurance races, Porsche has always uh, done very well. Uh, Formula One, we've had some highs and some lows. Uh, so I think because of uh, Netflix and Drive to Survive. I was just going to say that, the Netflix effect. <clears throat> that the, the audience has gotten so much bigger for F1. Uh, the attendance at Coda proved that. So... Um, yeah, it's going to be a golden age, I think, of motorsports coming up for uh, for Porsche. Very cool. Also in the news, I saw about Porsche pop-up dealerships. What's that all about? Yeah, I think it's uh, these, um, basically, uh, it's a way to reach, uh, I think, urban um, and you know, in the city type um, audience without having to construct a full-blown dealership. But some of the, some of them are going to be permanent. I said some yeah, are permanent, right. some yeah. are pop-up. because you're not going to need the amount of service bays uh, with the electric revolution coming that you would. But uh, yeah, are, are yeah. these going to be actually be owned by Porsche or Porsche cars in North America? Because I mean, I'm wondering how they avoid the state franchise laws that that basically have made it illegal for manufacturers to own dealerships for forever. Yeah, unless they take the Tesla um, way of doing things. Yeah. yeah, right now I think all these these pop ups in uh in studios are mm-hmm. are not in the U S. Yeah. So they're they might be finding a way around that at least in other countries. Oh, okay. But we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I you know when I first read about, it, I'm like, I didn't understand. We, you know, the dealership model in the United States has been around forever, and it's like cemented and lines of territory are you know very very defined, and all of a sudden now you're gonna drop. You know the ability to buy cars, service cars, and I can see how it makes sense in urban areas. But you know, places like these you to go in and order your car, I can't imagine they're going to have a huge inventory, right? It's like these are like micro shops. That's yeah, what it, it seems like. Yeah, and it's uh, you know the way we always talked about how you buy cars in Europe and how Porsche always told us yeah. how the Europeans order the cars versus the Americans show up on the lot and they want to. Drive something home that night. Yeah. And Porsche always said to us, why can't, uh, how can we convince uh, the American audience to order these cars? And so how they want it to. Yeah. And I think now things have gravitated toward that way where people are ordering them and not uh, necessarily uh, yeah, buying I, whatever's on the lot. And I, I honestly feel as though we've missed out because, you know, we were pre-programmed to just go to a dealership and and buy what's on the lot and when you're spending six figures on a wonderful porsche like to me why not take the time and order something and get exactly what you want i mean instant gratification i get it but with covid and and just a quick update on the search for loann's little daily driver you know i don't i haven't been to a dealership yet i've done a lot of research and um honestly looking for a car now is just trying to find the one that's on the lot and go and get it. As opposed to back in the day, you'd go to a dealership, walk the lot and kind of compare the ones that are available. And then, then you would deal on that car that you liked the most. Right. So it's all kind of changing. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, golden age of racing and the dealership model is changing before our eyes as well. And with Porsche coming out now with this PTS in every car available yeah, and however you want it, I think that's going to be even more an incentive for people to order cars because 
you know, we everyone jokes that there's only you know, what gray, white, mm. black Porsches, and the colors are very few. You know, people can wait three months, four months. They can get a unique color for themselves that yeah. uh, otherwise they'd have to settle for a gray. And, and, and ownership is another area. I mean, there's they tried the um, the subscription model. Um, you know, obviously, lease cars are around. Like, Damon, you know, you're much younger than all of us. Is, like, owning a car important to you or just having the car is important to you? Um, I personally like owning the car. You know what? I, 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 I say you're the youngest <laughs> and I looked at you, but then I thought back. I'm like, he is the... I have oldest three cars. millennial I He's know. The oldest thirty something on the planet. <laughs> Someone younger to come in here so I can ask a question. Well, I Our, own three cars and still need to pay off one, just, so I can't wait. Damon actually Connor? reads magazines at the airport. He's the only one that goes and buys a print magazine, a, a print magazine, and brings it on the plane. <laughs> yep, that's what I do. And then when the Wi-Fi fails, yeah, you know, he I'm, still I'm the has, king. He still has entertainment. <laughs> he, he chuckles quietly. <laughs> Oh, man. So, anyways, but um, speaking, Damon, thank you so much for, we, we talked about the Spark Virtual Racing Simulator, and you turned out a video so quickly, and it's doing well. We released it yesterday, and I think we're at 1,800 views. Yep. Um, what else is going on in the video arena? Uh, so, videos, have, uh, it's been a little bit slower than expected during the holidays, but we, we have several still coming up. Um uh, we have an, ex an air-cooled exhaust sound video uh, taken at Parade that has been lost in my external hard drive. I shouldn't say lost, but has been sitting there. So we'll be editing that up, and you'll get to hear about six or seven different air-cooled Porsches of all types and, and what they sound like. Uh, we have a Carrera RS 2.7 video that we shot, man, I think a, a month or two ago now, um, an original 73 2.7 that's been con converted to lightweight. Um a dry ice blasting video, so we clean up a 914 and show you how dry ice is used to make uh, a car's paint shine or at least get all the grime off uh, in time for prep, uh, cleaning off transmission cases, and more. Uh, it's a pretty interesting process, um, and that'll probably be in the next uh, couple weeks. And we also shot, I think it was four, or three or four 964 RSs. It was the or one 964 Carrera mm -hmm. 2 Coupe. An RS America, a 964 Carrera RS, and a Carrera RS Club Sport. So we had four 964s that we uh, got together in one location. We'll be going through what makes each of them unique and different from each other. Uh, so lots of good content coming up in the next month or two. Yeah, you've got a lot on your plate. Keep them super busy. And I know you're working with, I guess, multiple contractors as well to try to pump out this content on a weekly basis yep the goal is one video per week yeah and that it, uh it's definitely done wonders for our youtube channel and you yep. met your goal for yeah, forty five thousand subscribers by the end of december i think so was a, it was an interesting comment one one viewer said he was writing a comment and he did he always thought that we had four hundred and forty three thousand viewers i wish not the forty three thousand you know we're very proud of our forty three thousand but you know yes we we too if you're watching our videos Please share, please subscribe, please encourage others to watch because it just gives us the ability to provide even more content for you if we have good metrics. And we read all the comments. We do. <clears throat> we get them delivered to our email and uh, some are very uh, comical. <laughs> some, so, so the reason why I mentioned the whole getting, uh, getting dizzy on the $80,000 simulator is because someone asked. Because so, I had mentioned in that video that I usually get, you know, uh, motion sickness from VRs and such. And the guy goes, so at the end, you forgot to tell us, did you actually get motion sickness on the, on the, the bigger platform? And I did it. I drove that and I was fine. I like the one that, uh, Damon did a, uh, was it two minute video? It was like basically a, a, uh, quick summary of tech tactics live for the valuation. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. The 10 or 12 minute video. Okay, so 12 recut, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. But basically someone said, I like this without all the banter. <laughs> and I thought that means we have 48 minutes of VU banter. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not 48 minutes of <laughs> point being that uh, there is a lot of uh, I, useful I, information uh, that's uh, not banter. It's uh, especially with the um, the uh, uh, paint protection film one we did. Yes, that, that was uh, most of the uh, interesting information was from the question we got from viewers. Yep. While they were watching the show, it was uh, so. Yeah, the uh, shortened. Um, a Cliff Books version, I guess, 
or Cliff Notes uh, version is good too, but sometimes if you have the time, I, the hour shows as good as I want all, all of our videos to do well, but deep, deep in, down inside, I kind of wanted that Cliff Notes version of the values video not to do too well because then it would kind of crush <laughs> me that. <laughs> I'd be, home, the, I'd be home on Wednesday nights uh, earlier. <laughs> exactly. We only did a 12-minute show. But uh, speaking of banter, when we did the uh, the most recent Tech Tactics Live episode, it was sort of, when we, what was it that we were doing? Oh, we were doing the one with Nathan and the, was it 993s? 993 Buyers Guide. The 993s Buyer Guys. We had a lot of AV issues, and um, so we kind of wanted to redeem ourselves by having one at PCAHQ. So we did one on paint protection film. And we brought someone in. If you haven't watched it, please do. There's a lot of great stuff in there, including the banter. Um, but our, our guest was super knowledgeable. But the funny thing is the banter started even before we rolled the video. <laughs> no names. <Yeah>. No <laughs> names. No names. Um, let's just say an individual was uh, was wondering what the heck we were doing late in the evening at PCA headquarters and was wondering why they weren't involved in it. And uh, yeah, so it was like two minutes before we started to go live. There's this conversation with one of my buddies who, who brought his uh, 718 spider and this individual and they're, they're, <laughs> they're it was so loud. The conversation that <laughs> you, you thought he was yelling at Robert and I could hear it in the control room and uh, Robert, who runs, he does all the magic and switching cameras and everything. He turned around and looked at me and said, uh, what is that? And I said, uh, I think someone's on a phone. It must be a bad connection because they're yelling very loudly. But instead, they were yelling at the person through the glass who was on the outside. Luck luckily, when we went live, everything was quiet on the set and the, the video went perfect. We did, just to give you a little... Uh, inside on on the video, we 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 cut things, and I improperly cut um, some film. We scratched some film, and we healed it. And we talked about what's the difference between a inexpensive install versus a full wrap, well done. What you can expect to pay, what kind of timing you should expect to leave your car with. So again, if you haven't checked out, that was episode forty one, uh, paint protection film. And uh, tonight we will be recording episode 42 and we'll be talking about dash cams and one of my favorite topics car stereo and technology upgrades in your porsche rob do you know uh vu used to compete at uh car stereo competitions i ask her i ask her i do i do yeah i told him don't geek out too much on uh, he's, gonna, he's, gonna, he's looking for his trophies so he can bring them in the show absolutely off. i'm gonna bring in my trophies and i'm gonna bring my uh Pull out Alpine with my little bag. Man, it's, it's going to go retro tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we have vintage photos of his, uh, I guess it's the same Mustang you still have, right? Absolutely. But not the Fiero. Yeah, yeah. I, I will have a Fiero again. I just don't have one right now. Yeah, I <laughs> honestly, I think I've done more backdating of, of head units than updating in, in my life. Yeah. Um, I, there's nothing that looks worse than an old car than, than like a like a brand new head unit. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to show some options of, you know, radios. Back in the day when they were DIN size, and we'll talk about that on the video, half DIN. I mean, DIN and a half and, and double DIN. You know, these radios have a certain look, and they kind of match. They match the, the era. Um, but, you know, certainly newer radios that have all the blinking LEDs and graphics yeah. don't don't fit in really well in a G-body car and what options you can do right. there. But then you know, I mean, yeah, and, and I'm sure I get it. But I mean, to, to Porsche's credit, I mean, Porsche Classic kind of supplies the gold standard for um, radios that look good in, in old cars. But uh, yeah, those Continentals for you know 150 dollars are pretty tempting too for the yeah, so yeah, Continental yeah. makes this radio that looks very period correct. It's very inexpensive. The but tire company. I guess, yeah. Continental makes yeah. everything. Yeah, right. I mean, it's the same logo. I mean, uh, it's you, you see the same radio with either a Continental or a VDO logo on it, but yeah. they really look the part. They look... Um, they are bare bones. They are bare. Yeah, I mean, they've got an ox in, and that's kind of it, yeah. but... Um, you really listen you know, to music. I mean, you're not. Uh, don't, 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 don't go with the. It's NPR all, the, all, day. all the ex, all Well, the, Damon the, listens to NPR. It'd be fine for me. <laughs> <laughs> I it just drives me crazy when people say 
the only music I need is coming out of the exhaust from the back of my 911. That's BS. Come on now, folks. I so hear that from, I, our, from our marketing director, Jim, <laughs> and I'm like, at 65, 70 miles an hour, you are not hearing any exhaust unless you have Damon's exhaust in his Toyota. I love <laughs> exhaust sounds as much as everyone, but much like movies and much like in my life, I like to have a bass soundtrack that just makes it more exciting and more emotional. So, yes, if I'm on the track, I'm not going to be listening to, you know, whatever song. But, you know, on the highway, yeah, it's nice to have a little beat going, drive along, set your driving mood. Yeah, you definitely have to have a good audio system. And what I love is Mark Miller. Um, he's owned Westminster Speed and Sound. Yeah. Um, he's been around since I, when I was competing in high school and in college. So it's going to be. I'll try not to reminisce too much tonight, but it's going to be cool and to talk about how the, you know, not so much audio upgrades um, are the thing these days. It's more about technology upgrades and getting your, say, your dot two nine nine seven or dot one nine nine seven. That there really aren't that many options to, you know, change over to Apple CarPlay or new navigation systems. So he's going to talk about how you can do that and what you should look for in, in terms of... Uh, Are people not stealing car stereos anymore? Because no. I remember in the 90s, it was uh, detachable face plates and L that's like, all the like, stuff to hide. Oh, and code stereo. protection. Code protection. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there's nothing worse than, than, you know, you've got an old car, you disconnect the battery, you reconnect the battery, and, and it just says code, and you can't find, the, you know, where the previous owner... Is written the code down anywhere. You know, the code card is long gone. And it's, That's it's, always delightful. Theft, theft is always about resale, right? Like, they're not stealing it to use it themselves. Theft's about resa uh, resale. And, you know, audio systems or entertainment systems in cars today are so vehicle-specific. Like, you can't steal a 997 radio and easily sell it on, you know, the underground market. So, yeah, the, the, the whole idea of stealing... Stereos these days. I think that's a pass. I think now they break your windows to get, get your change. But what was what was the gold standard for for head units when when you were competing? Was it like Alpine, Nakamichi? So, what was I, what I was, was the? I was sponsored by Alpine. Craco? <laughs> not not Craco, not Craco. I was sponsored by Alpine, so I always ran an Alpine radio, and they have very um, traditional. We called them chiclets, little green chiclets, as for the. Oh yeah, have you seen the prices? Like just a cassette, you know. Green chiclet Alpine head unit is going for now. If you want to buy one really? and put it in an old car, yeah, yeah absolutely. It's six hundred bucks. I mean, for one that's been, you know, where the the I guess the cassette system has been, you know, serviced and everything else. Yep. You know, those are five six hundred bucks. Okay, I have to look over at Damon. Damon, do you know what a chiclet is? I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> that means he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't know what a chiclet is. I have one of those old face plates. You know, right, but do you know throttle. what a chiclet is, though? Or the gum? Oh, you do? Oh, yeah, okay. I know the gum. Yeah, Ooh, yeah okay. Oh, man. Oh, Damon was very quiet. Like, I don't know what these <laughs> guys are talking Damon's about. Damon's like, uh-oh, here comes a quiz. Who's going to throw me a question? <laughs> chiclet yeah. is... Yeah, it's a gum. It's a gum in like, yep. this aluminum foil. Yeah, the they still classic chiclet? Alpine head units had like six of them or something, and, and they were green. They were backlit green. Yep. Yeah, pretty cool. Exactly. Exactly. And, yeah. and one of the things I liked about Alpine, because during the, the, the 90s when I was competing in car audio, a lot of manufacturers went to buttons. And I can't stand buttons for volume. Oh, no. And Alpine yeah. was the only one that stayed true. They would have the chiclets on the right, and you always have a rotary volume knob, which even today in cars that I know they have you know buttons or uh, sliders or whatever on your steering wheel for convenience – but I love it when a car actually has a rotary that's, volume. That's knob. what drove me right. nutty about the Panameras that we had uh, like six months ago yeah. in, in the office was the knob did not control the radio. It really? controlled the menu. The oh, radio yeah. knob, if you remember, was uh, like, um, what's it, vertical on the, uh, on the console. It you was very in, in, not intuitive. No, yeah, was, I liked it. You mean the volume knob was when you put your arm on the armrest and your hand just sits right on top it's of like it. It's like a little cylinder. Yes. I'm not a huge fan of that no. cylinder. But oh, the cylinder. Oh, yeah, I liked it. I liked it because your hand fell there when you were driving. It wasn't. It's so hard to make it something that. Uh, no, because then I have to move, lift knob. my hand up to change. Or yes, but you're not feeling. I'm lifting my hand anyhow because <laughs> I think it's it. Now I've messed up all the navigation in my screen. And I've forgotten about adjusting the volume because now I'm trying to figure out where in the world my navigation went. 
But I still right. I think the OEM should just go back and look at a forty year old Alpine head unit, you know, in, in terms of good design. Get the, the rotary knob for volume, the backlit chiclets for, for your presets. That's kind of all you need. We're stout, we're sounding like old old fogies that are saying they used to make Yeah, I know. I, I so just, just look at <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna disagree with you because I think there's a lot of you know, a lot of reasons to go to a tactile knob or and have a unique feel for a button because what i like about that is when you're driving you can reach for it and know what your that button does whereas some of these newer cars and i'm not just talking about porsche just newer cars in general that are throwing everything onto this touch screen that pulls your eyes away from looking at the road and when you touch that screen nothing feels unique so you now have to focus on the screen to get anything done and I think that's pretty dangerous. And I'm surprised that hasn't been like an issue. It's well, maybe you got to get used to it. Oh, I know. I know. We're starting to sound like old fogies, but that's, that's how we feel. So Rob, what's going on with Pano Panorama? What is going on with Panorama? Uh, well, we just had a big planning session where we sort of plotted out the next six months. But uh, I can tell you one of the things that's going to be kind of exciting that's coming up is, and I'm not going to get too specific about it, but we're going to do an issue where the feature stories deal with people who are driving what are essentially full-on competition cars on the street. Mm. It's a rare breed of, of insane person who, uh, you know, who wants to do that and the photography is going to be great and, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So are you saying like factory built competition cars or cars that yeah. are modified to be? Yeah, no, no, like factory, factory top cars. Ooh. Um, yeah, uh, I'll give you a hint. One of the cars uh, was built in the early 60s. It's got four cams and, and you've never seen one driven on the street before. <laughs> What was I watching the other day? And it's on Jim's uh, trivia board, 80s trivia board, where I think it was Miami Vice. And it was a Porsche race car that was... 906. In, they, and that's a real 906 that they were driving? You think? I think it was. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, we... Yeah, uh, back then, we, they weren't that expensive where you... Well, I mean, they had they had the fake Ferrari, <clears throat> right? They had the fake Daytona. So, so when I was watching, it's like, are they actually driving a real... Yeah, I think it was actually called a Carrera 6 because of the whole Peugeot. Oh, right, right, right. Everyone calls it a 906. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. I, I, I missed that one entirely. I mean, we know people who drive <clears throat> 906s on the street, and we did a, a story uh, early uh, in, in 2021 about something that uh, our friends uh, at, at Road Scholars put together in the in the Colorado Rockies. But, um, yeah. Cool. How did I miss that? It was an episode of, of Miami, Miami Vice? Vice? Yeah. And the, it's like, um, I don't remember the storyline, but I was watching it. It had uh, 962s. I think it had Danny Sullivan and hookers. Not that they were related. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I don't know. Miami Vice. A hooker being killed. Yes, that's and, right. That, yes. He's, he's actually, the storyline is exactly yeah. correct. But uh, they were at the Miami the hookers, Grand Prix. Hookers blow and, and 906s very, and Danny and guys. Very, right. very 80s. Yeah, wow. Congratulations okay. on the January issue, by the way. Ah, the, yeah, the design issue, which we talked about in the last uh, podcast. Yeah, that should be dropping in the next couple of weeks. So, yeah, we're really excited about that. So are, are we going to have more theme issues or... What's what's your plans for next? Uh, yeah, you know, I, the, they seem to be doing well with readers and advertisers alike. So yeah, twenty twenty two is going to see more themed issues, probably three or four, uh, like like we did in twenty twenty one. And uh, you know, we want to try and keep it fresh. But again, um, you know, the advertisers seem to appreciate them. The readers don't mind them. So. Uh, yeah, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna do some more in 2022. And since you're more closely connected with press and PR at Porsche Cars North America, any hints of what we might have access or what we might see for next year? Well, like everybody else, you know, we're, you know, we're 
excited about uh, the special 911s that that they uh, they announced in the Motor Trend article a couple of months ago. Everybody wants to get their hands on a, a GT4 RS. So, you know, I mean, that's the stuff that we know about. I mean, who knows what uh, what we're going to be talking about in June? But but those are certainly the cars that, that we're really excited to get a look at right now. So, speaking of the GT4 RS, I shall make an announcement. You, we talked about this being Porsche Club Insider. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. GT4 RS. What do you think about that as the spring raffle car? Best raffle ever. <laughs> yeah. so we can how many? It, how many? Is that going to be like one we're going to give away, and then the we, rest? Are... We we we've been promised one allocation, and um, yeah, wow. So like, to me, it's Club Coop thank you very my much to to the folks at Porsche Cars North America. Thank you, Mark Karsten. Um, to, for making that happen, uh, you know, but it, one is amazing, but even if you don't win the GT4 RS, you know, our raffles are built where the larger it is, the more cars we have and the cars behind it, it'll be a 718 S. So still an amazing car. Um, again, $50, a raffle entry, not a bad return on your investment. <laughs> and probably the only way not to get one with the additional dealer markup. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I'm just super happy that we were able to get that allocation. Cause if you go to any dealership right now and you're talking about production time for these things, you might have to wait a little bit, but you will get a GT4 RS. If you are the number one grand prize winner for the spring raffle. Yeah, definitely exciting. So speaking of next year, how about new year resolutions? Porsche related only what's going on. I think this will be the year where I uh, spruce up the 964 a little bit. Mm. Since I bought it in 08, <clears throat> I promised my wife that I would not modify it. Because at the time, I had a 964 race whoa, car. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back up there. Back up there. You, when you got this car and you said you would not modify it. I do remember it's lowered. Well, it actually came lowered. It did? Yes. Oh, I thought you did that. Are you sure? I don't think your memory's correct. You know what? It had Bilstein shocks. <laughs> and- <laughs> See, you can't... Det- he can't. What he told his wife, the reality blends. The, uh, the uh, I think I did put springs on it. Yes, you did. And did. Uh, the aero mirrors. Yes, you did. I think that's it. Yeah, that's called modifying your car. That's a small. Yeah. So when Update, I promised, that's updating. When I promised Loanne with the Boxster not to modify it, I stayed true. I did not modify that car at all. It has a stock stereo. Oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving along. Anything else that you're doing, uh, Porsche resolutions for next year? I think modifying the 964 will probably keep me busy. Yeah. I'm looking at ducktails. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. I used to have the 3.8 RS tail on the race car. Yeah. Now, I like that, um, but I think I'd like to, I would love to put like those uh, Brumos type stripes. Yeah. On the car, because on a ducktail, that looks very aggressive and uh, wow, pretty cool and that's pretty like out there for you. Yeah, paint you, the, you I've got a set of Cup Ones from the race car, and uh, I would love to have them paint it like uh, Club Blau. Yeah, paint the arrow mirrors uh, also Club Blau. Yeah, you know, make it look like the uh, Cup cars used to be uh, that we had contrasting colors. So if I can do that, uh, I won't have to lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see. If you but if you did Brumo stripes, their blue is not. Club Blau. So well, I could a, change it to a Club Blau. I mean, I'm not looking. I'm not. I don't want to make a Brumos tribute car. Oh, I just so like the design. The design. Of the, so the so you would do a stripe like a blue Brumos car, but the blue would be Club Blau. That's pretty cool. Yeah, just uh, it'd be vinyl, nothing permanent. Yeah. So uh, we actually had a, a member that bought a Club Coupe recently, and he was wondering um, what the the paint code was for a Club Coupe and. Honestly, I didn't know, but I do know. So it's W60. Did you know that? Did not. Yeah. So I don't, I think we updated Renbo because it wasn't on Renbo. And that's why he asked. He's like, I checked Renbo, didn't have the paint code, but now, and, and you start, you're starting to see, you know, D- Club Blau being paint a sample on a number of cars, not just, you know, for not the, for, too for, much, though, because yeah. the Club Coupe registry is pretty good at shaming people for not doing that. shaming, but <laughs> just pointing out that someone painted their car. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't see personally see anything wrong with it. I think that's if you like that color, that's fantastic. And even if you painted your nine nine two club blau, it's not a club coupe, right? It's just a club blau nine nine two. Yeah, it's a pretty color. In fact, the 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 car that's at the top of the list for Loan's daily driver is a is a Civic, and they have this color called I think it's Sonic Blue or Boost Blue that looks very close to Club Blau. So I'm trying to see if I can't nudge her to go in that direction for a Club Blau ish. This path you're taking, I, I still say <laughs> it, it's going to end up with Macan. So it's you're probably right. <laughs> How about you, Damon? What you got going on for New Year's? Oh, I mean, I had to come up with this one quick, but it, it would be a, a true resolution is to uh, uh, modify my Porsche and hope it all stays together once once I get it back on the road. Um, I've got a few. I've got a project where I'll, I'll be replacing the clutch and the and the flywheel in my Cayman with a lightweight flywheel and Ooh. water pump expansion tank you know all, all that stuff while you're in there and if it all comes together and and stays running doesn't overheat i'll be happy so i'll see you at the autocross in 2023 <laughs> oh man yeah yeah the, the full year i need for that resolution now hopefully it's all done by the end of february wow so is that that going to require an engine out no not engine out but uh, i'll be dropping the transmission and um you know putting in semi-solid mounts when it goes back in um and you know dumping the coolant you know, and I guess the coolant expansion tank tank is a lot easier to do once the transmission's out. Mm. So you know there. the the whole pull the grease seal off my IMS bearing turned into just do everything while I'm in there. So. Wow, kudos to you. That's a that's a big job. But you have your Camry to drive while I do my Camry and my Golf. And so golf. Yeah. and a, and a Dremel. And we a, know what Damon can do with a Dremel tool. I can cut interior pieces. <laughs> <laughs> For those that. Don't know what we're talking about. I think that was from our buying a, a Cayman video, and we looked, or no, was it was the seats, uh, buying race seats, buying yep. race seats, and he he bought a oversized seat and ended up using a Dremel to cut his center console to accommodate the width of that seat. And he did a, it looks beautiful, but I can't believe he cut up the. Hey, you can't go I, back to stock without that. Yeah, when I built my race car, Saul's always my friend. Yeah. Tire yeah. rub, no problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's just cut <laughs> off the part that's wrong. You can always get another center console. It's no big deal. That's what I'm What I love too. about what you're doing is you are truly enjoying your car. Like you, you oh, yeah. wanted that, you wanted that specific car and you are now tailoring it to drive it the way you want to drive it at and across getting ready to spend more time on track. You're doing all the things that we talk about when people ask, what should I do to my car? In fact, there's one, um, there's one um, comment on the, on the Cayman video that you need to reply to where the guy's asking, you know, I kind of drive it on the street and should I be doing the upgraded oil over the air to oil separator? And do mm -hmm. I need to do a deep sum? I think the answer is no, but I'm going to let you answer that one. Yeah, yeah. So the the thinking goes, if, if you get the, the deep sump, which I have the two quart with a uh, anti slosh tray, is that you should probably go with the Motorsport AOS uh, because people who have gone from the regular sump with a regular air oil separator to a deep sump but kept their original air oil separator, some of them have, have experienced problems with how the anti slosh tray pushes the oil around or keeps it in place. And it'll, you know, get your AOS smoking pretty badly. So, yeah, that's one of those things where, and I'll, I'll answer your question, YouTube commenter, but you, you'd probably want to do both if you're going to be doing the sump. Yeah. But yeah. if he's driving it, I would think if he's just driving it on the street. On the street. Just keep it stock. Yeah, keep it stock is keep what I would stock. do. Exactly. Have you ever owned a car with a lightweight flywheel or driven one with a lightweight flywheel? I've driven an RS America with a lightweight flywheel, and uh, that was many years ago. And, and I loved it. Um, it was a little bit tough to keep the car from stalling. You know, mm -hmm. when it's cold, it, it, the flywheel couldn't keep the car at idle when it was cold. But once it was warmed up, it was super easy to do heel toe. And even if you messed up a couple up shifts, you know, the, the flywheel's so light that any mistakes you make are sort of blend into the whole gear yeah, change. It'll be interesting to hear your uh, impression that you had it for a while. Yeah, some people say that lightweight flywheel is not a good thing for a street car, but... You know, GT3 it, RSs, GT2 RSs, they, they've had them in the past. I've definitely driven cars with lightweight flywheels, and you'll need to learn how to keep your big toe on the brake and your pinky toe 
on the throttle just to kind of keep things even as you come up to a stoplight or get ready to go because that's the that balance, right? Yeah, it's fun yep, to drive because exactly. it revs up so quick. Yes. Yeah. It once you're moving, so it, it'll, it's easier. But when you're pulling away from a stop, that's when you know you'll be sweating bullets trying not to stall the car, roll back <laughs> on a hill. So exactly. How about you, Rob? Uh, I think this is the year when I finally find uh, affordable and convenient storage so I don't have to keep cycling through cars the way I, I do. <laughs> for, for Porsche cars? <laughs> <laughs> Porsche cars. For cars, no. The, uh, the editor of, of Jalopnik, Rory Carroll, just uh, moved about three minutes from me, and, and uh, the property he bought is an outbuilding. It looks like it would store like 20 cars, so oh, I may have to hit him up. Oh boy, <laughs> this is not a good scenario for Mr. Sass. Now he's going to... No, it's like a nuclear winter scenario. <laughs> but <laughs> well, yeah, so that's, that's my, uh, my resolution. Well, for me, um, you know, in 2020, I, I did a lot of autocrossing with, with you guys. And I, I, in 2021, we were just so busy. I, I didn't get the opportunity to drive competitively as much as I'd like. So I'd like to do that. But first, I've got some... Maintenance things I need to do on the 996, um, where I, I think it's, I don't know if it's a mass air sensor or if there's a leak somewhere, but when the engine gets hot, the idle, the idle is not steady. And sometimes like I, I come to a stop sign and it kind of almost clonks out and goes to like 500 RPM, but it drives fine. It's just the, at, at idle is kind of up and down. So hopefully it's an easy fix. Um, otherwise I'm going to have to see if someone has one of those smoke machines and plug it into the intake and see if there's some leak somewhere. Yeah. And and what worries me is it doesn't happen all the time. So I'm sure when I take it to, you know, a buddy or whoever to help me with this, they're going to be, Oh, it's fine. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And then the other thing is I've got some maintenance on some other cars. So it's going to be a maintenance year. I know Manny was probably hoping to hear me say something about the 914, but I, I don't know if my 914 is going to actually make it to parade. We'll see. And first step, uh, much like alcoholism, is <laughs> admitting that you actually have a 914, <laughs> which means uh, bringing it out of storage, which in your case is, what, three sets of blankets covered under uh, and body uh, parts a storage too. rack in a body yes, shop? Yes, Uh Thank you to my buddy for, for keeping it uh for as long as he has, and we just haven't been able to connect to pull it out from all these parts and blankets and body shop dust and and finish it up. But now patina patina is actually kind of a thing, so maybe I just get it running and just leave it unpainted and just throw clear over it. That would be fine. <laughs> At this I'll, point, just I'll, get I'll, it running. At least I can get in and, and drive it. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank all of you for listening. If you aren't a current PCA member and you own a Porsche, what are you waiting for? Be sure to have your VIN handy. And for those of you that don't currently own a Porsche, check out our test drive program. You can sign up at PCA.org. Until next time, stay safe and we'll catch you down the road.